struggle a little bit with how to approach uh, Easter um, because I understand what it really is, but I also do understand what it's supposed to represent. And so that's that's the the direction I always want to go with it. But I do want to start out this morning just talking a little bit about where it's at in the Scripture and how it got put in the Scripture. And then we'll move into how and why it's important in our life and why we celebrate Easter. Um, have you ever been in a situation before where somebody's told you something or maybe multiple people have told you something multiple times? And even though you you know in your heart that what is being said is true, you still have a hard time grasping the fact that that might be true. And so sometimes you got to go see for yourself. Sometimes you have to maybe touch it, smell it, hear it. Well, that's kind of where this this whole message this morning is going to be based around. And the title of the message, Out of Darkness. Because when you understand where the world was leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you understand that the world was in a dark place. And we'll talk a little bit about that more this morning, but four times in the Bible, the disciples were told about the coming resurrection. Mark, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Matthew 26, 61. Mark 8, 31. And John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus Christ foretold of the fact that he was going to die, that he was going to be buried for three days, and that he would resurrect. Now, he didn't always say it in that exact term. At least once he did in Mark. The other ones... He used analogies. He used Jonah, the, the story of Jonah. He used uh, the fact that the temple would be rebuilt in three days, you know, where all the people was thought he was talking about the physical building. They even argued with him. They said, how is, it, is a man going to rebuild a temple that took 46 years to build, and he claims he's going to rebuild it in three days? Now, of course, you and I understand he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body. But even though they were told about the fact that he was going to resurrect, how many of them actually believed it? I'm going to say zero. Now, again, it's one of those things that I think, don't misunderstand me, I think they believed it because Jesus said it, but they didn't believe it because it had never happened before. They didn't believe it because, yeah, I know, okay, this is, this is the Son of God. I mean, we believe it, we claimed it, but he's going to die and then come back to life on his own. That's where they were. Now, turn to the book of Acts chapter 12 for a second, if you would. Now, Acts chapter 12, do you know that there is only, and I say only one, it, I haven't looked at every single one of them, but of, of the mainstream books that are out today, there's only one Bible that has the word Easter in it. Only one. And a lot of people think it's a mistake. A lot of people think it's a mistranslation. Acts chapter 12, in verse 1, it says, Now about that time Herod, that's key, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now I've always told you this, in your Bible when there's parentheses, God is trying to tell you something extremely important. 
And he tells you in, chap in, in chapter 12, verse 3, in parentheses, then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, a lot of people read over that and think, hey, great to know. What's the, feast of, what's the days of unleavened bread? I have no idea. Anyway, moving on. However, that's extremely important. Because in verse 4 it says, And when he had apprehended him, now let me tell you, explain that, when he, Herod, had apprehended him, Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quarterings of soldiers to keep him. Okay, so here's what we got. Herod, king of the Jews, right? No, he's a Roman king. He's a, he's a Greek. He's a Gentile. He, has, he, doesn't, he doesn't even like the Jews. He doesn't like the Hebrews. He doesn't celebrate the Hebrew customs. Why? Because he's Greek. How many of you in here celebrate the Jewish customs? Why? You're not Jewish. You're Gentile. Well, you're, if you're a believer this morning, you're Christian now. There's only three people groups in all the world's history. Do you know that? You're either Jewish, means you were born of a full-blooded mother, Jew, and a full-blooded father, Jew, and you have full Jewish blood in you. You're Jewish. If you don't have 100% pure Jewish blood in you, you are a Gentile. Period. Then, all of a sudden, there came a period of time that was kicked off by what we're going to talk about today, where you could accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior and take your blood that is tainted and that will lead you to the grave, and you can apply the pure, perfect blood of Jesus Christ to your heart that he shed on Calvary's cross and apply it to your soul and become a Christian. That's it. So as you sit here this morning, you're either Jewish, you're Gentile, or you're a Christian. Let me tell you, if you're Jewish and you're not a Christian, you're on your way to hell. If you're a Gentile and you're not a Christian, you're on your way to hell. The only way to heaven during this particular time period God instilled is to become a Christian, bar none. So you got Herod here who's a Gentile, and he kills James who's a Hebrew, and he, he, he uh, arrests Peter who's a Hebrew. Oh, and by the way, just to step back a couple days, they just crucified Jesus Christ, who was a Hebrew. See, Herod's on this terror right now to kill all these Jews. Oh, and by the way, in chapter 7, they stoned Stephen, who was a Hebrew, for preaching the message of Jesus Christ. So you got a lot of Jews being killed and crucified during this particular time by, by uh, Gentiles. Now it says in here, that Peter was taken prisoner, and he tells you it was during the days of unleavened bread. Now, I know this is going to be foreign to some of you, but I'm going to put it up here anyway, just to give you, so you understand what's happening. In the Jewish first month, the month of Eve, on the 14th day at 6 p.m., is called the Passover. Fun fact. If you're, if you're visiting this morning, you'll understand I love fun facts. Some of them pertain to nothing. Some of them pertain to everything. Fun fact. Easter this year, today, the whole week, Passion Week as they call it, is the exact same days of the original week that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. Okay? In, in uh, Passover was this last Wednesday. Passover, when Jesus was crucified, was on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Wednesday was the 14th. Jesus Christ was in the tomb on the 15th, 16th, 17th. Three days and three nights, and at 6 p.m. on, because remember, the Jews' day is not day and night. The Jews' day is evening and morning, according to Genesis chapter 1. 6 p.m. is their start of their day, like midnight is the start of our day. At 6 p.m. on the 17th, which then moves you into the 18th, Jesus Christ came out of the grave. Well, Passover this year was on Wednesday. We stand here on Sunday, the first day of the week, the same day that Jesus Christ actually came out of the tomb. It all come together the same way this week. Now, 15th, 16th, let's see, 19th, 20th, 21. This right here, as soon as Passover starts at 6 p.m., we're now on the 15th. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Jewish Custom, or 
as we just read, the days of unleavened bread. Okay, that's important from what I'm getting ready to show you. At the end of verse 4, when it says that Herod was going to keep Peter uh, in prison, notice when he says he's going to bring him out. He intended to keep him after Easter to bring him forth to the people. It's the only time in any Bible, any modern Bible, that that word appears in, a, in Scripture. It's not a mistranslation. It's exactly right. When the, when the 54 translators of the King James Bible sat down and compared the, the Scriptures, every verse of Scripture, at least 15 times before they put it, put it out to the public, they understood that the, the, the word there in the Greek, Pascha, that everybody says means Passover, and it does, but is also the same word for Easter, they understood it couldn't be Passover. And I'm going to show you why. It has to be Easter. First of all, what would Herod, a, a Jewish killing Greek king, care about the Jewish feast of Passover? Passover is all, everything to do about Israel. It's the day that, that God passed over all of the people in Egypt back in the book of Exodus that had put the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the two side posts of the door and on the lentil post of the door. And when Jesus said, when I come through Egypt that night, I will pass over every firstborn child and animal of every family that has applied the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home. And from that point forward, the Passover was instituted. And it happened on the, at 6 p.m. on the 14th day of the Jewish first month. All the way back in Exodus. Herod could care less. He just killed the Lamb of God that this Passover in Exodus represented. Why would he care about the Passover in Acts chapter 12? It's a rhetorical question. He doesn't. He celebrates Easter, which is a Greek pagan holiday. We can get on that on a Thursday night if you'd like to come and figure out how that plays in. Here's why we know it can't be Passover here, because the Bible told you in parentheses that when this happened, it took place when? During the Days of Unleavened Bread. Well, guess what? The Days of Unleavened Bread doesn't start until after Passover is over, because 6 p.m. on the 14th is Passover, and as soon as Passover takes place, it happens like that. Then we move in at the 15th to the Days of Unleavened Bread. I guess there's one way that it could work to mean Passover. Herod would have to literally wait a full year to bring Peter back out and make a mockery of him. You're holding the only book in the world that has correctly and put Easter in Acts chapter 12, verse 6, or in 12, verse 4 in your Bible. But it is not the way we celebrate Easter today. Now again, we can get into that on a Thursday night if you'd like to. I just I always feel context is proper. And so I always want to give you context. Now turn to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 14. You need to understand not just what you believe. I believe Easter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Fine, that's what you believe. Why do you believe that? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and came to die for my sins so that I could have eternal life. That's what I believe. But why do you believe that? That's what's important to me around here. Not just to tell you what, but to tell you why. Now in Mark chapter 14, what you get is the last week of Jesus Christ's life. And he goes day by day, sometimes almost hour by hour. And I'm just going to give you the quick rundown. I, if I told you 14, I'm in 11. Start in 11. <clears throat> this is what we know as Passion Week. Now in Mark chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, 
and he sent uh, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. And from that point, what do they do? They go and they bring the colt so that Jesus Christ can prepare himself to have the triumphal entry. This is Saturday, the uh, 10th of the first month, Abib, or Nisan. Now come down to um, verse 9. And they that went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about and upon all things, and now even tide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Okay. What you got here in, in verse 9, 10, 11 is the triumphal entry. Jesus Christ comes in on Palm Sunday. Sunday the 11th. And notice in verse uh, 11 at the end it says, Even tide was come. Well, even tide is 6 p.m. That's when the Jewish day flips over. So in verse 11 you have Monday now. So you've got the triumphal entry on Sunday the 11th. And by verse 11, we're now on to, uh, did I say Sunday the 11th? We're now on to Monday the 12th. And then if you go down to verse 20, uh, verse 19, it says, And when even was come, he went out of the city. That's the end of the day, Monday. Verse 20, and in the morning, that's Tuesday. Now the 13th. Now flip over to chapter 14. And in verse 12, from 11:20 all the way through 12, 13, and 14 to verse 12 is all the same day. And it says, And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover. What day is that? The day they killed the Passover is on the 14th. They killed the Passover at 6 p.m. So we've now moved into Wednesday, but it's, it's the night before. Tuesday at 6 p.m. into Wednesday. There's your changeover into Wednesday. Now flip over to 1542. The reason I go through this is because you will be told in Christianity Jesus Christ was crucified on what day? Friday. That's why we call it Good Friday, right? It's a myth. Apparently, Christian scholars failed math 101 because everybody agrees that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb on the first day of the week which is Sunday but yet Jesus Christ told you that he would be in the heart of the earth as Jonah was in the heart in the in the belly of the whale three days and three nights if you die on Friday how do you come up with three days and three nights and come alive again on Sunday. Now, I could get three days, okay. Well, they were dead part of, part of Friday, and they were dead Saturday, and they were dead part of Sunday, okay. I get three days. But you can't cram three nights into there. He wasn't killed on Friday, folks. You say, what's the big deal? It's a big deal because if you don't know the book that God wrote for you and God gave you, you may think things are little and don't make a difference, but if you can't figure out the easy things, how's God going to be able to get the deep things to you? If you don't believe the things that are surface level, how are you going to understand and believe the things that really matter? Every detail. Every detail is important. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And now, when even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Notice the context. Jer uh, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went and boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. You know what's happening here? Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross. And at even, on the day of preparation, the 14th is called the day of preparation. Why? Because you spend the day preparing to crucify the Passover lamb at 6 p.m. So then that evening, you cook the lamb for dinner and you sit down with your family and you have Passover supper. 
Here's another little tidbit that you get misled on in Christianity. Jesus Christ did not eat the Passover supper with the disciples. He couldn't. He was the Passover lamb. How was he going to eat the Passover supper when he was the Passover lamb who was crucified at Passover? He ate the Last Supper on Tuesday night with the disciples and then became the Passover lamb at 6 p.m. on Passover and was put in the grave during the Passover supper time. So in 1542, when it says now even was come, that is 6 p.m. on the 14th. That is the Passover. He was killed on Wednesday. Then in 1601, and when the Sabbath was passed, now everybody gets confused on that and say, well, that's why he was crucified on Friday, because the next day was the Sabbath. Only if you go over to the book of John, it tells you that there are certain times a year that you have what's called a high Sabbath. Four times a year in your Bible, there's a high Sabbath. You know what they are? The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 15th of Tishri, the Jewish seventh month, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, the first day, and the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. You can have three Sabbaths in one week, just like they did here. Thursday, Saturday, and whatever day that ended up being. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the next week. Three. This wasn't the Saturday Sabbath. This was the High Sabbath. This was the Saturday Sabbath. And it makes very clear when you go, and, and I don't have time to get into it this morning, but it, you can figure out very clearly that it couldn't. this Sabbath could not be Saturday. It couldn't be. So in 16.1, you got the Thursday High Sabbath, the 15th, the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Notice then it says, And Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, what were the Jews not allowed to do on Sabbath days? Work. work. Therefore, if they bought spices, somebody was working to sell the spices. They couldn't do that. So when if, if he died on Friday and Saturday was the Sabbath and they went to the tomb Saturday evening, when did they have time to buy spices? They didn't. He died here. This was a Sabbath. They bought the spices here. They had another Sabbath, and they went to the tomb. See how that works? So you've got, in 16.1 and 16.2, you've got the Thursday Sabbath, the Friday the 16th of buying the spices, then Saturday Sabbath, and then look at verse 2 in, Matthew, in Mark 16. And very early in the morning of the first day of the week. There's Sunday morning. See, you've got a whole week. From Mark chapter 11 to Mark chapter 16, in five chapters, you have the whole week of the life of Jesus, of the, the last week of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, it's also interesting to me, here's, you guys get two fun facts today. What chapters did I tell you the last week was laid out in from Sunday to Sunday? 11 through 16? 1611. 16, Can't get around the book. Can't get around the book. Out of darkness, folks. The last three hours Jesus Christ was on that cross from the sixth to the ninth hour, which would have been from noon to 3 p.m. on Wednesday, after, uh, Wednesday afternoon. Much like today, what time is it? Almost 11? Oh, good. I got a couple more hours then. Beautiful, bright morning. Sun's out. And what happens at noon? That sun is high in the sky. And yet your Bible says what about that sun during those three hours? Darkness. S uh, scientists and archaeologists and astronomists and everybody else say it was one of the great Lunar eclipses. And maybe it was. But have you been outside on a lunar eclipse before? I mean, I'm talking, I'm talking full lunar, what was that, like 2017 we had that lunar eclipse? How long do those last? 
I've never seen a lunar eclipse last for three hours. Right. You know what else I didn't I didn't uh, have a problem with during the lunar eclipse? It wasn't dark. Yes, it was darker than when the sun was out bright and shining in the day, but it wasn't dark. The Bible says darkness. It went dark. And by the way, it's going to happen again in the tribulation period. Three hours of darkness. You know what that was a picture of? That was a picture of the way the world was at that period of time. It just rejected God's Son. Do you know what the soul of every human being that rejects God's Son looks like? It's dark. Do you know the only light that a soul has that rejects Jesus Christ, God's Son? It's the light from the fire in the pit of hell. The Bible tells us that the bottomless pit is utter darkness. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross those last three hours and the world went dark, it was a picture of what every human soul looked like without Christ. And it was a picture of what humanity looked like from the rejection of God. And folks, I know that sun is shining bright this morning, but can I just tell you something? I'm just an honest person. Don't ask me if this shirt looks good on you. I'm going to be honest with you. Don't ask me if, if these shoes match my clothes. I'll be honest with you. Now, Brian's shirt, he's looking good this morning. Stand up. Hey. Share with everybody. See? I'm honest with him. Folks, this earth right now, this world right now, this society right now, if you can't figure it out for yourself, this world is dark. And the darkness from the pit of hell is being, pun intended, shined very brightly right now. But there's good news. You know one thing I love about God? He never leaves a person worse than the way, way he found him. Now, we may choose to be left alone, but God will never leave you worse than he'll find you. In Revelation chapter 21, he's even not going to leave this earth worse than he found it. He's going to renovate this old earth by fire. He's going to bring down a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. For those that have trusted Christ, for those that have loved God, for those that have followed his book, But on that cross, it was dark. I asked you about a moment in your life where you knew something was true, but you just couldn't grasp the fact that it was true. And imagine the only hope you had in life was now gone. Because Jesus spent three and a half years teaching and preaching to these folks that, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm God's son. I'm going to make everything better. I'm going to bring peace. I'm going to restore all things. I'm going to give the kingdom back to Israel. The kingdom of God's going to be reestablished. Everything's going to be great. And those disciples, they looked around at the way the world was, probably much like you and I look around at the way the world is, and think, wow, oh, this place is a mess. Casey and I were talking yesterday afternoon which I know the Bible says it's going to happen this way, but when you actually live it, it's weird. Anything that we knew as right is now wrong. And anything that we were brought up as wrong is now right. And, and this really spawned off a stupid conversation. We were talking about an intersection in Lee Summit that there's been some a, a big argument about whether you can
turn on a red light or not. And even the, the engineer of the city that helped design the interchange, he said, yes, by the law, you can turn here on a red light. And so everybody's like, cool, we're, we're good. But then the police department came back and said, well, actually, I know the law says this, but in this particular case, this, this, and this, so no, you can't do it. I did not. Luckily, I did not. Not that I know of. Now, I did get a, a envelope in the mail of a picture of her in her through the windshield like that. <laughs> Nothing makes sense anymore. Even even something so simple like when there's a red light, you can make a right turn when there's no traffic coming. But now we say, well, technically, no, you can't. But it's written in the law that you can. So why can't we? Well, because... Nothing Nothing works. Nothing's right anymore. Nothing makes sense anymore. If somebody doesn't think it should be that way, then they're just going to change it. And guess what? Little peons like me have absolutely zero say in it. Nothing's in order anymore. Now, as frustrated and as annoyed and as mad as Casey gets at me because I get fired up and then she thinks I'm mad at her and they have to explain, no, I'm not mad at you. I'm just annoyed by the situation. I'm just talking loudly. And she says, quit yelling. I said, I'm not yelling. I'm just talking loudly. And it turns into this whole thing. All because you can't turn right on red. But I know why this whole system is a mess. Because the earth is cursed. All the way back from Genesis chapter 3. The earth is off its orbit. Or as we might say, it's off its rocker. Everything's a mess. And God has drug it along for 6,000 years. He's brought it along. How many of you have ever drove a car that shouldn't be driven anymore, but yet you, know, you, you add just a little more oil... You tighten the lug nut just a little tighter. You put the spare tire on. You know, you, you just rotate the spare tire. Yeah. Duct tape. That's what God has done to this old earth. It's just the duct tape is wearing off. And the spare tire is about to blow and your engine can't take any more oil because it's so gooped up. That's where they were. Now I want to use one person in particular. Go to Mark chapter 16 again if you're not if you've moved. <clears throat> Let me pray before I do. Father God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I thank you, even though we should celebrate every day of our life, the fact that you came out of that tomb and you resurrected and you overcame death and sin and hell. Not for your sake. You had nothing to gain. It was for my sake. But God, we can stand here this morning. We can sit here this morning. We'll use this day that the old world has given us as, a, as the one special day a year that we can actually talk about the name of Jesus Christ and it doesn't seem to be out of order. But don't let that stop our mouths. But God, we just thank you for the ability that you've given us to have a book that explains it all to us in great detail. That gives us the great truths of what went into this moment, what went into this period of time, what went into this specific hour. And Lord, I pray that this morning we can see the emotion that is behind this particular individual as she stands there and wondering and looking and weeping and being in distress. Because she thinks she lost the only hope she had. And Father, my ultimate prayer this morning is that if there's a soul in this room who stands around and looks at this old world, they flip on CNN or Fox or get on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is they might see and just see one story after another about how bad things are, folks, that, God, we would just stop, turn it off, open the good book, and realize that we're not in as much darkness as we think we are. 
God, we love you for the pure fact that you love us. We ask now that you take the words in this book and you make them real, you make them truthful, and you help us to see, even though it was 2,000 years ago, how important this event is in our life right now, today, in 2023. We love you. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 16, verse 9 says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now I want to start here because this is a very great verse and the simple fact that the first person Jesus Christ appeared to was not Paul, the man who God delivered the entire set up of the church, the man who God told how the, the whole church would play out the next 2,000 years, the guy that God actually took to the third heaven according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and revealed to him the, great, the greatest mystery outside of the fact that Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, the mystery of the church, the fact that you and I can have a personal relationship with God through His Son. No, He didn't use Him. He didn't use the, uh, the apostle that, John, uh, that God loved the most in John. He didn't use the apostle that God uh, told that would become the apostle to the, the Jews, Peter. He used a woman. Why? Because we men, we're, we're dumb. We're prideful. We're arrogant. There would have been some statue erected at this spot right here. There would have been some church built right here by the guy that claimed to be the first one to see the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And his name would be on the walls of, of every church building and there would be sidewalks made after him and, and, and churches would bow down and worship him. God knows how men, men are. He also understands that women take things differently. They take things to heart. They see things for the way they are. They don't try to manipulate circumstances and manipulate things and, and work things through. And, and It took the simplicity of the heart of a woman. I love that. Because there's a lot of times in Christianity that you know women get put on a back burner, so to speak, and, and get told that you know, you're not as smart or you're not as important or men are in charge and all this stuff but why is it that every woman in the gospel who jesus talked to it believed in him every single one not every man very little men did and i also love the fact that god or that jesus yes god appeared to a woman that he had cleansed I mean, there's, there's no hiding the struggles that Mary Magdalene had. He had to cast demons out of that woman. You know why I think that's important? Because when Jesus came to me, he had to cast some things out of me. The first time I saw Jesus Christ face to face, I had to come to the realization that I was a sinner on my way to hell and I had some demons in my body and if I didn't get those taken care of, those demons were going to take me right to hell. The Bible says, straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leadeth to heaven. But the road to hell is not narrow. It's a 12-lane highway. Many are the ways that lead to hell. There's only one way, Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 20, I'm going to flip back and forth between those two for a moment. All, all four gospel accounts are wonderful. And I don't mean to leave Matthew and Luke out, but for this morning's purpose, Mark and John are going to cover for us. In John chapter 20, In verse 10 it says, Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Now, what you had is you had a, a, a number of them that came to the sepulchre that, that morning, the tomb. But you find out in 2010 that then the disciples went away again. They left. 
They went to the tomb, Jesus wasn't there, and they left. How many times have I heard over the years? And I'm not mad at you. I'm not saying anything about it. I've felt times where I felt like I was alone before. But how many times do we hear? I just didn't feel like God heard my prayer. I just didn't feel like God answered me. So what did I do? I left. I didn't have time to sit there and wait. I didn't get a response. So I left. But look at verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. Not Mary Magdalene. She wasn't going anywhere. She was staying put. Nothing else in the world at that period mattered besides figuring out where the man who told her, he was going to heal all things. He was going to make everything straight again. He was going to make everything right again. And she read the passages in Isaiah chapter 9 where he was going to come and establish a government that would last forever. This was the man. And he's not here. Where in the world is he? The other disciples said, I got business to take care of. The sun's coming up. I got to go. She said, nope, not me. And then she's left with these questions. Back in Mark chapter 16, in verse 3. It says, And they said among themselves, This is Mary Magdalene and Mary and Joanna, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? Now this is right before they get This is when they're on their way. They said, Who's going to roll the stone away? Now, folks, you got to understand that before you got saved, there was a stone over your heart. There was a stone in the way. Just like with these ladies, they were coming to anoint Jesus with the spices and with the oils, and they knew that the only thing that stood between them was this massive rock that they themselves were not going to be able to move. And so they were questioning on their way, who's going to be able to move that stone? Let me tell you something. In life, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, Who's going to move that stone? I don't have the power to move. Hey, I don't care how good of a pastor I would be attained to, which is not very good. I don't care how good of a leader and an evangelist and a pastor Paul became. I don't care how good your husband or your wife or put anybody in that position that you want. Not a one of us are going to be able to move that stone that stands in front of your heart. And that was their question. That should be your question. Who's going to move that stone? They had to get to the body of Jesus Christ. There was a stone in the way. The other question comes back in John chapter 20, in verse 13. It says, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she says to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And then, in verse 14, it says, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, but knew not that it was Jesus. And then Jesus asked her in verse 15, Why are you weeping? Second question for you. Why weepest thou? Who's going to move the stone that's covering your heart, and why are you weeping? That's the two questions Mary got presented to her when she came to see Jesus face to face and he wasn't there. Now look at Mary's position on top of that in John chapter 20 in verse 11. But Mary stood without. She was alone. I got news for you. I'm going to do the best I can as as a pastor, as long as you allow me to be your pastor. I'm going to do the best I can to stand right with you, walk with you, help you. At the end of the day, the only person that's going to be able to stand with you is Jesus Christ. The only person that's true... You say, oh, you really helped me today. No, I didn't. I just gave you what Jesus said. And he helped you. 
I can't, these hands cannot heal anybody. These words cannot heal anybody. I cannot change you. I cannot transform you. But according to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, this book can. And the Bible says, this is the mind of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Mary stood there alone because Jesus wasn't there. Let me tell you something, folks. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you stand alone. I don't want you to. I don't say that proudly. I just speak the truth because I want you to understand that you don't have to stand alone. You can come out of the darkness just like Jesus Christ did. That's where this thing's headed. The other thing, her position. At the sepulchre, weeping. Well, we already know that because that was one of the questions posed to her. Why weepest thou? She stood weeping alone. And you know the best place that you can be found by Christ? Is standing alone weeping? Because by all intents and purposes, that's where you were when you got saved, if, if you're a believer this morning. Now, you may not have been weeping out actual tears, but I guarantee your soul was weeping. We've talked about it many, many times before. When you accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, the hand of God reached down into the pit of hell and pulled your soul out. And we know from Luke chapter 16 that the soul of a man can weep. We know the soul of a man can, can feel and have fear because the rich man in hell did. Think about that for a second. Think about, now I don't know, I, I don't even know if this is true or not. I'm just, I'm just picturing in my head. I'm picturing my soul. When my soul was in hell, as I sat on the front porch of my uncle's uh, house on that, that spring or fall morning, I don't remember wh when it was, I was in third grade, sat on his porch swing and we were swinging while he asked me the questions. And I told him I wanted to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Can you imagine what my soul was doing? Because in, in Psalm chapter 40, it talks about being pulled up out of the miry pit. Could you imagine what your soul was doing when it saw the hand of God reaching through the deep, down through the universe, down into the heart of the earth, and through the doors of hell? And your soul knew it was coming for you? Oh, man. Imagine. And then imagine the feeling that your soul had as God was lifting that thing up through to put it back on the seat of heaven. Oh yeah, there was some weeping going. And then it says she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre. She stooped because she was weeping and she wanted to see even closer. That's the position, folks. Mark chapter 15. In verse 38, now this was back on the cross, but it says this. I will start in verse 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. Now that temple, that veil was in the temple. We, we talked about it last week. And that temple, that veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Nobody was allowed in the holy of holies except for the high priest. And that's where the communication with God was done. But you know what happened the moment that veil was rent in twain? It meant that God's structure of the Old Testament law was done with. The Holy of Holies was exposed. But have you ever thought about this for a second? The moment Jesus Christ gave up the ghost and the veil of the temple, was do, you, do you know what else was rent in twain? The veil that separated your soul from heaven. The access to that, that veil was so thick and heavy that the hand of God just literally like a piece of paper just 
Before that time, no man or woman could have access to God except going through the high priest in the, in the temple. In that moment Jesus Christ died, the veil of your heart, the veil of your soul was rent in twain, and you immediately had access and have it still today to God sitting in the Holy of Holies in heaven. Think about that change. Think about from Mary standing there weeping in darkness, not yet understanding somebody was about to come out of that darkness. In Ezekiel chapter 36, in verse 26, listen to this verse. I love how God just hides things in different places in the Bible. Start in verse 25. Then, I, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now this is a this is, uh, tribulation passage, so it doesn't apply to us doctrinally. But practically, listen to what he's about to say in verse 36. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Here it comes. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Stony heart. Folks, I'm telling you, that stone on that sepulcher represents the stony heart that you have before you and I get saved. And there's only one person that has the ability to move that stone, and it's Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene didn't have the power. Joanna didn't have the power. Mary, the mother of Jesus, didn't have the power. John didn't have the power. Peter didn't have the power. Who had the power? The angel of the Lord. And who's the angel of the Lord? That's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that has the ability to move that stone. And before Mary realized it, she stood there and weeped. And before you and I realize that that's the only way that stone is going to get moved, we'll stand there and we'll weep. But then Jesus Christ asks Mary a question. And I'm going to ask you this question today. Nothing's changed since this moment, folks. It's the same principle. In John chapter 20, verse 15, Jesus says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Let me ask you this morning, whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? That's all Jesus Christ wanted to know. And folks, I can tell you, when this whole thing blows over, the Bible says in the book of James that this life is like a vapor, folks. It's here today and gone tomorrow. You young ones don't understand that yet. And I know that the older in the room would tell me I still don't understand it yet either, but... The last 20 years of my life have absolutely flown. I don't get it. And when this thing's all done, God's going to look at us and He's simply going to say this, Whom did thou seekest? That's going to be the only thing that matters. He's not going to care about what status we elevated to in this old world. He's not going to care what our wardrobe looked like and what whatever. You, you fill in the blank. God doesn't care. Let me say it again. God doesn't care. Do you really think that a God who first created you and I to worship and praise Him and then secondly allowed His Son to be humiliated to be scourged, to be beaten to the point of bleeding, to have a crown of thorns shoved on his head, to be hung on a cross, to bleed out and to suffocate himself for six hours? Do you really think that the mundane things in this life that we think are important, God's really going to care about? No. Whom seekest thou? Then out of darkness, 
Mark 16, 2, very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Now, why would God use that? Why would God allow it to be at the sunrise? It could have been any point. Now, here's a little side note. Here's, here's a parentheses note for you. Jesus Christ didn't resurrect at the rising of the sun. Jesus Christ came out of the tomb at 6 p.m. Saturday night. This old world went 12 hours without even realizing Jesus Christ was walking around. That's a little scary. But maybe it was for this purpose. The church in your Bible is pictured by the nighttime. We're in the nighttime right now. The sun in your Bible is a picture of Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter 4, he's called the sun, S-U-N of righteousness. The moon is a picture of a Christian. The moon does not give light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun onto the earth. It's a picture of Jesus Christ reflecting his light off of us as Christians that we're to reflect out onto the world. When does the moon shine its brightest? In the nighttime. The church age is a picture by the nighttime. But the first time that Jesus Christ is seen by this woman, Mary Magdalene, was at the rising of the sun. Sunrise. Because every sunrise is a picture of Jesus Christ coming up out of that grave. He didn't have to. Bless you. Do you know that at some period during these three days right here, Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and he delivered the Old Testament saints out of Abraham's bosom to his father. Probably on this day right here, the Feast of First Fruits. He could have stayed there. He didn't have to come back. He could have said, enough with this, I'm done. But he didn't. He didn't. First Peter chapter 1, or excuse me, uh, chapter 1, verse 19. Here's why God in his foreknowledge did it at sunrise. Where's the verse I want? Maybe it's two. Yeah, sorry. Second Peter one nineteen. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do, do well that take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Folks, from the moment Jesus Christ hung on that cross until this moment in Mark chapter 16 at sunrise, this world was dark. Yes, he died for sins, but he hadn't overcome death yet. It would have done you and I no good to have atonement made for our sins, but if there was no resurrection to overcome death and hell, we'd still be stuck in death and hell. Jesus Christ is the light that shineth in a dark place. Amen. And when he walked out of that tomb or when Mary saw him at sunrise it was a perfect picture of this old world being lit up by the light of God now here's where you make it personal finish the verse until the day dawn here it comes and the day star arise where in your heart Jesus Christ is the day star He's the bright morning star. He's the sun of righteousness. And the only way you and I can get out of darkness is to allow the bright and morning star to arise in our hearts and move that old stone of that old sepulcher out of the way and free us from the bondage of hell and death. Just like he did for old Mary back there. Hey, you don't have to weep anymore. You don't have to be in darkness anymore. You don't have to, to wonder anymore. He's alive. He's free. 
He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And by the way, that old verse says that he endured this cross, despising the shame, and counted as joy. What would be joyful about hanging on a cross for six hours and suffocating to death? Nothing. It was joyful because he did it for me. He did it for you. And then he didn't stay in that tomb. He got up and he walked out on his own power. And he said, I'm alive! Be free! Let the day star arise in your heart! Whom thou seekest. Mark chapter 16, verse 6. All four Gospels say this, but it says, He is risen. Do you know Him this morning? Have you ever accepted Him into your heart? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, that if you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. Let me ask you something. If you don't know this morning, quit putting it off. This life is but a vapor. Somebody told me this morning about a person they knew that within three days of finding out he was sick at 30-some years old, gone. Just like that. And his eternal life is set. In stone, whether he was in he going to heaven or whether he was going to hell, the moment he closed his eyes on this side of eternity, the choice was over. The chance was done. Don't put it off. You know you have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your resurrection. I thank you so much for dying on that cross. I thank you so much for going to the heart of the earth. During those three days and three nights, you were dead physically, and you wrestled the devil. And you wrestled him for one purpose, for my soul. And in that wrestling, Lord, you were able to steal the keys of death and hell back from him, according to Revelation chapter 3. And you took those keys of death and hell, and you unlocked Abraham's bosom, and you freed those Old Testament saints. You took them to heaven and presented them to your father, and then you came back with those keys to finish the mission, and that was to free my soul. And to free anybody's soul that so chooses to allow their soul to be set free. Father, I ask with all my heart, if there's somebody in this room this morning that does not know 100% that when they die, because the Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man once to die. They're not certain this morning that they will go to heaven. Father, please don't let them put it off. Allow them to use this wonderful, glorious day that you've given us, a day to celebrate the resurrection, to make a choice to seek you and allow you to move that stony heart out of them and be put a new heart in them. God, I thank you for the opportunity you give us. I thank you for the ability that you give us to understand and to believe. Now, God, with everybody's eyes closed, I'm going to ask, if there's somebody in this room that's not certain that they know you personally, that they're not certain they're saved, they're born again, that they're not certain they're going to heaven, Nobody's looking, Lord. Just please let them put their hand up so I can pray for them. Is there anybody that needs prayer about getting to heaven? They're not 100% certain that they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They've never trusted in the work that, on Calvary's cross for their sin. If you need prayer this morning, just give me a little wave. You don't even have to stick your hand that high. Amen. Father, we just thank you for everything you do for us. I pray that you allow us to use this day to praise you, worship you, spend time with our family. And Lord, when we bow our head tonight, I pray that we take some time to give you the honor and the glory that you deserve. We love you and thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 2.22. Let's close out with 2.22. Actually, I'm going to change that on you. 113.
Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Thank you, Lord. Though I'll cherish the old rugged cross, my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. And exchange it someday for a crown. On the last. To the old rugged cross. I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday. To my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. John Reed, you close us out, sir? Or did he leave? Neil, you close us out? Father God, thank you for this day. We can bless us much more. What's up, man? How are you? Good. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to the emergency room Friday. Um, got late. <laughs>